That Dominic Sambrick was, uh, of course, a didgeridoo, uh, signalling the fact that we have reached part two of our survey. Welcome back to Australia. (laughs) Our survey of Aussie PMs. Um, And Dominic, in the first episode, we got to uh, 966, hadn't we? We proceeded slowly, uh, but steadily, um, in the sort of uh, Jeff Boycott. Yes, yes. uh, Um, Cricketing style. Um, and we've got to the, yes, the departure of Robert Menzies. Australia's um, longer serving prime minister. And so if you missed that, and uh, we talked about Australian political culture and the the different sort of forces within it and so on and parallels of Britain and why we don't know more about it in Britain. Uh, so if you missed all that, what on earth is wrong with you? Go back and listen to the previous podcast. But we're going to kick off now with Harold Holt and one of the great stories in Australian history. So Harold Holt, Tom, you know where his mm-hmm. ancestors were from? Um, probably from Cornwall or somewhere. They were from the great city of Birmingham. Were they? They were Villa, from Birmingham. Villa fans. I don't know if they were Villa fans. They may well have been Birmingham City or they may have preceded um, yes. the creation of those clubs. Anyway, uh, so his ancestors were from Birmingham. He went to boarding school in Melbourne and um, he had been Australia's youngest MP in the early 1930s. And he was very much a sort of protege of Menzies, I think. Mm. right through and he'd been a labor he'd had a sort of great it was regarded as one of australia's great labor ministers so he got on really well with the um with the leaders of the trade unions which is Were actually they quite they probably were mates and that's quite similar to british conservative politicians of the same period who also yeah. generally got on well with the trade unions until the late 1960s so was that the Queen always like preferring prime labor prime ministers, labor prime ministers yeah. exactly and then he was treasurer which is the equivalent of chancellor Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, um, Treasury Secretary in the the United States uh, and was seen as, you know, good, kind of pragmatic. I mean, obviously, this is a a boom time for Australia, the the sort of mid-60s. Everything seems to be fine. Everything's going well. Except for Vietnam. Except for Vietnam, which we'll come to. So Harold Holt becomes Prime Minister, succeeding Menzies. And Vietnam, he's very enthusiastic about Vietnam, isn't he? I mean, he, he sort of like triples Australia's troop commitment. And he goes to the White House, doesn't he? And, and famously says that we're all the way with LBJ. He says he personally yeah. is all the way with it. Because if you read the text of the speech, he basically says to Johnson in front of the whole press corps, you know, you'll have moments when you'll be doubting yourself and people are all against you. But remember, there's one person who's all the way with LBJ, and that's him. Harold. I mean, he doesn't yeah. say it in that fantastic accent. <laughs> He says it in his own voice. Uh, and Australians are horrified by this because they think it's terribly servile. Yeah, it's demeaning, isn't it? It is. De- well, you know, he- you're trying to throw off the chains of uh, the British oppressive you're throwing state. throwing on the chains then, of, yeah. the Austri- of the yeah. But have you seen photos of him with LBJ? So LBJ yeah. is obviously massive and Harold Holt is quite is much shorter. And he look, looks like he's having a brilliant time, but he also looks like he's LBJ's Batman. <laughs> And not in the cricketing sense. And not in the cricketing sense. No, but they yeah. um they go and they get lashed by the swimming pool together at LBJ's ranch in Texas, I think. They have a I mean, great LBJ time. had quite a kind of Australian approach to language, he's, didn't he? And he's quite Australian. I think he's quite yeah. an Australian figure, LBJ. You can imagine him at a barbecue. Definitely. I think that's what they do in Texas. They just sit around eating grilled meat, drinking yeah. beer, swimming, yeah. getting hammered, talking about yeah, how they're and, looking and, forward and, to their triumph in Vietnam. And Har- Harold Holt, of course, is a great guy for for he loves the beach and he, he, lo- does, he loves the he good likes swim. A, he likes he? A swim. <laughs> I know it's terrible. We shouldn't laugh about this. <laughs> no, I, no, I really thought when we were when I was looking at my, the, you know getting my notes and stuff, I thought so, when yeah. we do this, we should do this at the yeah, somber tone of way. tragedy. So this is this is um, just before Christmas in 1967. Yes, it is. So it's he's the been prime minister December. for just over a year, and he goes for a swim off the Victorian coast, the Cheviot Beach. Famous for its for its rips is never seen again. Yeah, so never he seen vanishes. Again. So he went so, with a, a couple of friends, didn't he? I think yeah. So they come. They get they get picked back up, don't they? So they get back in. But yeah. He's never seen again. And Where's so, Harold Holt? So the, theory, so, so the likely theory is that he drowned. Well, let's let's be honest. Well, he drowned. <laughs> he drowned. He, I mean, he, yeah. <laughs> but there are all there's um that there is another theory. That actually, all along, he'd been um, spying for the Chinese. The Prime and that he'd, Minister and that he'd, Spy is the name of the book by Anthony Gray. And that he'd been picked up by a Chinese submarine and taken to China. So I looked into this theory. This is an absolutely... So you don't... Um, you, you, you well, let me tell you the that. theory. The theory is that Harold Holt was recruited as a Chinese agent as a very young man. And he originally thought he was an agent for the Kuomintang, the Chinese nationalists. Chiang Kai-shek. 
Then, sometime I think in the 1950s or 60s, his handlers revealed to him that he was actually an agent for the communists. Holt, despite the fact that he's working for the one of the time. most anti-communist sort of um, government chief executives in the mm -hmm. in the in the democratic world. So, how do you think Menzies would? I mean, Menzies wouldn't like. He'd have been very unimpressed. He would be very unimpressed by the idea of working for Chairman Mao. Yeah. <laughs> so the claim is that Harold Holt, um, he he got to become Prime Minister of Australia, still working for the Chinese, and then eventually the Chinese decided that he was in danger of being rumbled or something. So they sent a, a submarine to lurk off this beach. Harold Holt swam out to the submarine, was picked up, and spent the rest of his days very happily eating, you know, Chinese food in yeah. China. Yeah. And and his wife, when she was presented with this theory, said he didn't he hated Chinese food. <laughs> yes, he hated, which is obviously the clinching argument against it. <laughs> um, um, but also, and there's another th there's another theory that he was um he might have been murdered by the Viet Cong. So those are the three yeah, theories. He drowned. Was, yeah. He was murdered by the Viet Cong, or he was picked up by a Chinese submarine. You know the Chinese theory. The most fascinating thing about the Chinese theory is the man who who came up with it, who's a, a British reporter, I think, a Reuters journalist called Anthony Gray, had himself been taken prisoner in China. So, so I wonder if if uh, if he'd picked up <laughs> intimations, or had been driven mad by his incarceration. Yes, well, that's, in, in, yeah, in, either, which is either alternative explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this is still not the best detail about Harold Holt. No, tell us the best detail, Tom. Okay, so the best detail about Harold Holt is that the memorial to Harold Holt is a swimming centre. Yes, it is. So in Melbourne, the Harold Holt Memorial Swimming Centre, I believe, stands there to this day. So the, the, the truth um, is that they were building that swimming centre, I think, before he, <laughs> before yeah. he drowned. And they needed a, a memorial. But why on earth? I know. I mean, it's absolutely... I've actually had a look at it online. It looks a very good... It looks yeah. a lovely pool. Yeah, it does. Really nice. It does. So, but I wouldn't uh, swim in it just because I think, well, you might be picked up by a submarine. Or... <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> who wants to swim in a swimming pool that's named after a man who drowned? Madness. It's it's distinctive. Yeah, it is. I, but I, I mean, agree. It's very distinctive. I mean, it's not like you can. I mean, it's like naming a car after Princess Diana or something. I mean, it's well, just it, yes, but Dominic, perhaps it's reflective of the um, the, the can do Aussie spirit. Maybe that that we as uh, as poms think, as simpering you know, poms, uh, yes. Yeah, so whereas you know, whinging yeah. about it. Whereas, whereas Australians uh, are plunging into that pool yeah. even as we speak. I drowned. <laughs> Let me get in there. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that would be my hunch. Um, okay. Anyway, so he, so Harold Holt has drowned and yeah, had a swimming pool. That's the end of so him. he gets succeeded by a guy called John Gorton. Now, he's now, a very good character. He's, an, ex I, well, he's an excellent character. But, and I should but say, so unknown outside Australia. Right. I mean, he's, so, he's, almost, he's almost French in his characterness. Well, which is exactly how he's described by my friend Steve Kinane, who is the um, ABC um, uh, Europe correspondent. And right. So I think in the wake of the French president's episode we did, a number yeah. of Aussie say, followers said, please, can you do one on Australian prime ministers? And they didn't say, it in, that. They didn't, didn't say it in that accent, Tom. Hi, mate. Could you do uh, Aussie Prime Ministers? Is right. what they said. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was, like you, a bit nervous about that because my knowledge of Australian politics isn't all it could be. Um, but I was uh, having our first cricket match of the season. I had to drive Steve down and his son, who's doing a Australian politics course. And so they told me all about it. And Steve then sent me a briefing note. And his, descri his, account, his description of John Gordon was slightly French in his lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> slightly french <laughs> but you know also he started uh, as an oxford man yeah um he, uh, gorton studied at brazenose college and was captain of the rowing team like david cameron he was like david cameron well team, we'll come really. we'll come to cameron later because there's an interesting kind of link there but um i i saw um a uh, a fellow of brazenose over the weekend and he, he shall remain nameless because <laughs> he's <laughs> apparently there's an anecdote that um that gorton was contacted by the principal of brazenose to tell him he was being made an honorary fellow which is a rare accolade and uh, Gordon asked if there was any money in it for him. <laughs> oh, really? That, that's pretty funny. And, and then he said, please don't say this because it might be actionable. So oh, right. I, I apologise. <laughs> Gordon's not still alive. I mean, no, he's that's not true. Alive. No, that's Although true. he did, he did, um, he died at the age of 90. So, you know. Yeah, I, th I think 98, wasn't he? No, I think it's another one who's 98. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. I think, um, was it oh, no, that's Whitlam. It's got Whitlam, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, we'll come to Gough Whitlam later. Let's stick with Gordon because Gordon is great fun. So, so Gordon is a war hero. Yes, he had been in the um, Air Force, hadn't he? And he'd crashed onto an island in Indonesia. And he'd previously been quite a sort of 
slightly matinee idolish, I would say. Um, and they have to basically do they Remake rebuild his face? His face? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, so, it's a it's a terrible story because he. Um, so this is just this is I think just after Pearl Harbor, and he's essentially part of the um, the air garrison looking after Singapore. And obviously that goes terribly wrong. And so after Singapore falls, he gets evacuated with various other Australian pilots and they get, um, they get sunk. And so he spends a day in a lifeboat surrounded by sharks and they, you know, they narrowly, so he's narrowly avoided death twice. He gets picked yeah. up. Um, he, he, yeah. And they have to basically rebuild his face. So he has scarring for the rest of his the rest of his life and he then you know he returns to the um to the air force and crashes again twice um so slightly slightly jinxed jinxed but um, also lucky i mean you know he could have been killed oh, yes, then, you know? suppose, yeah half <laughs> half empty half full uh well actually tom just before we just before we come on to his sort of political persona um the that bad luck that he had with his physical health i mean we think of australians as the sort of absolute epitome of you know strapping good health and so on. But actually, we forgot that there was a caretaker prime minister between Harold Holt and John Gorton, who had even worse luck with his health than John Gorton did. So he was a man called John McEwen, and he was only prime minister for a matter of weeks. Do you know what happened to him? No, I've never heard of him. So so he was, only, him. he was only really brief as prime minister. I mean, I think sort of weeks. Because so the Lady Harold Jane Grey of Australia was. Prime because ministers. after Harold Holt had drowned or been picked up by the submarine, they needed to elect a new, um, a new leader. And so while that leadership election So he was, was the interim. He was he, the interim. He was the default one. And what happened yeah. to him? He had dermatitis so badly that um, he would walk around in Canberra with kind of blood seeping out of his feet. Oh. So it's a bit like me when I was a on like that walk. Yes, <laughs> that walk. walk. Yes. Except the difference is his was not a one-off. His was a serious condition. And he ended up in such pain that he starved himself to death. Was this while he was prime minister? No, it was 1980, 1980 though, not long afterwards, oh, sort of 11 that. or 12 years afterwards. Okay, that's tough. That is tough. So anyway, he was so the shortest. He was the shortest. Well, he was the one with the worst prime skin. Minister. I think that's fair. And the worst feet. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so back to Gorton. So back so, to Gorton. Gorton then comes in. So Gorton is a war hero and he is elected as the new um, Liberal Party leader. He's very anti communist, isn't he? He's very anti communist. He's very. But he's also, his big identity is that. He is an ordinary bloke. He's a mm -hmm. he's a larrikin. He is a he is, you know he he's he's plain speaking, but also just a little bit French. He is a bit French. So, so how does his Frenchness express itself? Well, so the first thing he's only just been prime minister for a matter of months, isn't he? And they're they're because of his anti communism, he's very committed to you know the alliance with the Americans, sort of the commitment to Vietnam and all that sort of stuff. And he goes, to the US, he goes to talk to the U.S. ambassador at the U.S. embassy, doesn't he, about Vietnam? Well, he's been invited to go there. <laughs> yeah, but he's, and, been, but he's been drinking. <laughs> but he's been drinking. And his aide keeps saying, uh, come on, mate, we've got to go to the U.S. embassy. And he's, oh, I'll just have another. Ah. <laughs> that's how we spoke. That's very similar to your John Lydon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's there with a young lady sympathising. I, I think, yeah, she's still a teenager. <laughs> yeah, she's very, very young. Jerry. Jerry, yeah. uh, Jerry Willisey. Um, <laughs> and so, so finally, um, Gordon's, you know, he's, oh, ah. and they, they all get bundled into the prime ministerial car. And he says, oh, come along, Jerry, come along for the ride. <laughs> and they head off to, they all head off to the, um, to the uh, American embassy. And, um, <laughs> and Gordon's drunk. The American ambassador is, they have a kind of bust up over strategy or whatever. The American ambassador starts to get drunk. They refuse to talk to each other. <laughs> um, and uh, Gordon is basically, all his attention is focused on his lady companion. Yeah, Jerry. Yeah. So he, she told her the next day, didn't she told her brother, didn't she? Yeah. Um, and so it gets out. Uh, her brother said, uh, it was an image that stuck with me. 2 a.m., our troops in Vietnam getting killed. And here's the prime minister and the American ambassador getting pissed and refusing to talk to one another. It certainly seemed to me that the prime minister's priority that night was being with Jerry. Um, and then <laughs> there was some inappropriate behavior with L Liza Minnelli. He met her at a nightclub called Checkers. Yeah. Um, and I think he inappropriately touched her. Um, like Paul Keating and the Queen. I think a bit more inappropriate than that. Oh, dear. This is a real theme um, of so, political life, clearly. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it is a bit French. 
I mean, it's, it's not very, yeah. it's it's not up there, really, is it? With the, but the French wouldn't the behave in that, or anything. But well, it's it's if you remember, Giscard um, was accused of groping the um, the buttocks of a German reporter at the age of one hundred and twelve, wasn't he? Yes, it's maybe that that sort of line of yeah, maybe yeah. So so he 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 manages to win an election in nineteen sixty nine, um, and the other thing that he he does brilliantly is to promote the Australian film industry. So, so we owe the career rock of, and all that kind of stuff. We owe the films of Peter Weir and the career of Mel Gibson to John Gorton. Is that John what you're Gorton. saying? Yeah, pretty much. Well, that's something, isn't um, it? But he loses, uh, doesn't he, in 1971? He yeah. Lo- he, he's, well, he's, is he stabbed in the back by his own, by his own party? Is this the, the beginning? Yeah, so, the, so, so, the, so, yes. Um, so backstabbing is quite, will become an escalating so, theme. So they call them this. spills, leadership spills, don't they? And they absolutely love them. Australians, yep. they yep. their MPs love having leadership contests, yeah, and toppling each other, and yeah, and and generally they well, the the best spills are generally done by people who up till that point have usually have appeared to be very close colleagues and great friends, and then yep. suddenly one of them just plunges the knife. Well, this is the downside of mateship, is that if it if it ceases to be elite, then it just goes goes wrong, goes pear shaped, yeah. So you know, um, G- so Gorton after he lost after he lost office. He sort of disappeared or whatever, but he um, he then started doing a radio show called Sir John's Viewpoints. Are you familiar with with the <laughs> no, no, <laughs> radio show? So he would um, he attacked um, the granting of property rights to Aborigines. Thought that right. was a very bad idea. Uh, he called for the legalization of prostitution. That is very did. French. I that's, bet he did. <laughs> that's very <laughs> French. Yeah. And he attacked um, the cacophony known as modern music. Ah, oh, fair enough. <laughs> which he didn't approve of. Yeah. Um, so, so he's a character, I think. And this so. is before Men at Work. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, or Midnight Oil. Um, <laughs> um, so he's so succeeded by um, the most boring prime minister. Well, is he boring though? You you've described him as boring, but I think you've missed some interesting things about him, William McMahon. So, well, only- okay. So the two things that I've I noted down. Yeah. So he's described in the Australian Dictionary of Biography as a blend of cautious innovation and fundamental orthodoxy. That's very I mean, that's, boring. Given that what... is boring. However, yeah. Goff, Whit- anybody. Go- Goff Whitlam, leader yeah. of the Labour Party, who we will come to very, very shortly, um, described him as Tiberius on a telephone. Yeah. And Tiberius was was notorious for all kinds of shenanigans. He was. wasn't just French behaviour; it was Roman behaviour. Yeah. So, has, have your researches in the? Um, they have. In the Bodleian. I've I've not just gone to the Bodleian Tom, I've gone to other other libraries, other leading libraries. Okay. So And there was a suspicion that hung over my mum was very he was very dapper. He was a he was a dandyish man. Mm. And there was a suspicion that hung over him that he was in fact gay. Because he got Oscar. married very late in life. And in fact, yes, at one at some point he or his wife, I think, said came out and said publicly, he's not a pufter. In in that mm. in those precise terms, so there was that issue, I, and I think actually, if you go to websites, I mean, obviously, I don't pretend by any means to be an expert, as as listeners will know, on Australian history, but websites on Australian kind of LGBT history sometimes say he's Australia's first gay. Okay, well, that makes it more interesting then. But he's also utterly hated by everybody involved in, with the world yeah. of Australian politics. And to he was an ex- voted Australia's worst prime minister. To he? an extraordinary degree. So there's a veteran Australian political journalist called Laurie Oakes. Do you want to know what he said about... Uh, yeah, go on. He's like a lot, one of the longest serving kind of observers of Australian politics. He said, um, my mom was devious, nasty, dishonest. <laughs> <laughs> he lied all the time. <laughs> <laughs> he lied all the time and and stole things. What, so, what did he steal? <laughs> he describes this incident where he said McMahon came to his radio station <laughs> to give an interview. <laughs> it's such a strange. It's not very French at all. Um, and no French Valerie just kind of stand would not stoop to this and stole a tape recorder. <laughs> what? How odd. <laughs> he stole a tape recorder and then when challenged, he said, he said, it's mine, I own it, despite the fact that it had the radio station. <laughs> so, not a Napoleon of crime, he was not. <laughs> it, had the, it had the name of the radio station <laughs> engraved on the machine, but he's yeah. like, no, it's mine. <laughs> and and oh. actually, well, that, that, I say it's not very French, but that reminds me of something that I think um, Mitterrand or somebody said about Jacques Chirac, which was. Um, Chirac is a man who um, 
if you found him sitting in your in your chair eating a big eating a big tray of jam tarts with jam all over his face and you challenge him, deny Sherrick would say <laughs> I've, I've never seen any jam tarts so obviously the this maman yeah. is the equivalent of that yeah. he, okay well I to really take it back that he, if he's stolen he your boring. tape recorder um, he'd deny it he's a master criminal <laughs> yeah. he's a master criminal he's um he's at the he's an L, LGBTQ yeah. uh, hero He's a post boy um, for diversity, <laughs> and and he's Australia's worst prime minister. Uh, yeah. So I think I think you know that's I think we need a break after that, don't we? We do because that was because far too enjoyable. After uh, talking of enjoyment, after the break, we come to probably Australia's most entertaining prime minister. You think so? Uh, yeah, I think so, and definitely the most extraordinary episode in Australian political history. Definitely. Um, and so we will return with the premiership of Gough Whitlam. Welcome back to The Rest is History. We promised you excitement and excitement is coming because we have the, the premiership of Gough Whitlam upon us. So Gough Whitlam, Tom, is quite a patrician figure isn't he he's he's a um, patrician figure he's uh yeah very he, he's brought up in canberra which had become australia's capital yeah under menzies so menzies um, had, had really pushed that and because his father was was a human rights lawyer the crown solicitor and then the commonwealth secretary general um yeah so he's basically australian royalty yeah and he's he's done law at sydney university and he's been the and he's done and classics he's, he's so under, under Enoch Powell, who was you know, the youngest professor of Greek in, in, in the history, in the history of the discipline. Yes, yes. Uh, so hence the Tiberius on a telephone quip. Oh, right, yes. So he knows, his, he knows his Roman history. But um, he didn't like Powell's teaching, is that right? Didn't rate it. Uh, yeah. saw it. He thought he was yeah. boring. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe Whereas Whitlam, didn't... Whitlam was never boring. Um, no, he and he's, so he's um, very, he's kind of dandyish figure. So he... I mean, essentially, you would you would think that he would be on the right. He would be a conservative. Uh, you know, he he's a kind of natural Tory, but he isn't. He's on the lab. He's on very much on the Labour side, but he still has the kind of the fondness for dressing up in white tie that you might associate with the kind of the Menzies tradition. So um, he attends a parliamentary reception in 1954 with the Queen. Um, all the comrades go in their lounge suits, uh, and he goes <laughs> in white tie and tails. Well, it's a good way of standing out, isn't it? It is. And also, yeah. the thing is that um, if you're a sort of very overtly patrician figure, that can actually play quite well in some ways in a weird way with, with on the left, because you, you look like an eccentric and you look like a kind of a character. Well, but also, um, I, think that, I think the British parallel would be with Tony Blair. Tony Blair. Because by this point, Labour has been out of power for a very, very long time. Yes, yes. And essentially... People in the people in the Labour Party are, are are despairing of ever getting back into power, and the party's riven by kind of factional rivalries, um, arguments over scabs and rats and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I think that Whitlam is able to come in rather like Blair in that he scrambles the antennae of people in the Labour Party. They can't mm. quite place him, and so he's able to to kind of bring in. You know, I mean, he he foreshadows New Labour. I yeah, because he appeals to the. Sub we talked a bit about the suburbanisation of Australian political culture, and I think he appeals to the sort of. He he went he he brings in some sort of suburban middle class voters as well as the sort of traditional Labour core. Yeah, and he's he's very very slick, and he's very good at, um, you know, razzmatazz in the election campaign that he fights in um, uh, in seventy two. He gets a young Australian media magnate who's just setting out on his career to back him and that is Rupert Murdoch yes Rupert Murdoch owns the Australian which is Australia's only national newspaper and they back Whitlam and Whit Whitlam has already shown a capacity for taking um dramatic and unexpected steps because even before Nixon does it and we talked about how Australian politicians often blaze a path for American and British politicians he goes to China so he goes to uh, China yes. before Nixon does he goes to meet Chiu Enlai yeah which is an extraordinary thing um, do you know? I, do, does this influence Nixon? I mean, they must be aware of it. 
I think there must be Pissinger. aware of it. Yeah, I don't think there's a conscious, oh my gosh, Gough Whitlam has gone. Of course, he's he's not prime minister when he goes to China, is he? He's he's Labour leader, but he's not. But prime this minister. is still this is still the Cultural Revolution. So but the I think fact it's a sign, that a Western leader has gone. Is, exactly, uh, it's a yeah. sign of China opening up. I think. Um, I mean, uh, people who know more than me about um, uh, Henry Kissinger's thinking in 1971 would would know more about this. But I don't think it's a. I think it's. Uh, a straw in the wind, as it were, but I don't yeah. think it's necessarily a sort of a, a massive motivation. But yeah, no, he's a very he's a very charismatic figure, isn't he, Whitlam? Yeah, yeah, I really mean, he's, charismatic. He's incredibly fluent and um, uh, sort of incredibly self confident. I mean, that's one of the things that brings him down is that he clearly is not he's not a man crippled by self doubt, and he doesn't. Well, think I think he's he, he's not a he's not a details man, but he's very much a broad brush man. Yeah, and he's very good at, 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 rather as Blair did, at kind of capturing a spirit of optimism and and regeneration and rejuvenation, uh, and his slogan, "It's time." Yeah, <laughs> and it is time. Well, he so, does all kinds of. I mean, obviously, as with our previous podcast about German and and um, French leaders, we've 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 been reasonably policy free. But yeah. um, but yes. um, but yeah. uh, uh, Whitlam does. He does things like he abolishes conscription. He pulls the troops out of Vietnam. He has um, he makes a, a, a move towards universal health care, which then Bob Hawke will take up again in the 1980s. Equal pay for women. Equal pay, exactly. There's sort of Aboriginal. Uh, there's a Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs, isn't there? So he sets that up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so this is, the, yeah, it's under Whitlam that basically white Australia starts to come to terms with the injustices that yeah. historically white Australians have done to the uh, the native inhabitants of Australia uh, and also oh, oh and he um he's very hostile to um sporting engagement with, with apartheid South Africa yeah because so he he's very to lead in that. he's very anti-racist but partly because of his father's background as a human rights in the commonwealth and in yeah. the commonwealth yeah, yeah. secretary general uh, and also crucially he um abolishes the sales tax on condoms <laughs> right well that uh, would go down well with uh, Valerie she's got a stink. but you know the th the thing that um Steve Canane was most yeah. excited about was that it's Gough Whitlam who gives Edna Everidge her damehood. So I didn't Edna know Everidge she'd been officially awarded this damehood. Yeah. So this is, so this is a film, Barry McKenzie. Right. In which Barry Humphreys stars. Yeah. And Barry Humphreys, Australian comedian, plays the part of Edna Everidge, uh, who is a uh, housewife superstar, isn't it? What is it? Superstar housewife? What is it? Yeah. Um, um, the first, yeah, exactly. Something like that. And in the film, she comes back from a tour. And Gough Whitlam is there waiting to, 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 to greet her and gives her a damehood. And the joke about this is that actually Whitlam has abolished <laughs> knighthoods and damehoods um, as being, you know, pommy nonsense. Yeah, because he's quite, he's a reformer, he's a modernizer. He's, he, that is quite Blairite, isn't it? That he, yes. he's sort of, he's leading Australia into the shiny new future. And then basically, I think, I mean, it's it's actually typified by, it's inter so interesting, it happens in October 1973, the Queen opens the Sydney Opera House. And the Sydney Opera House, which everyone forgets now, but at the time, was yeah, very controversial. It was a disaster, wasn't it? But, over budget. And but it's this symbol of modernity, of this shiny modernity. And of course, it's in the, it's in October 1973, that as people will know if they've listened to our previous podcasts, that the world economy is thrown completely off course. Yeah. By the Arab-Israeli War, and that Whitlam's whole sort of agenda, which is based on this kind of bright, optimistic, you know, progressive future, is undone by the by the oil shock because and he, by the need for austerity because he's not prepared to countenance. So he doesn't um, he doesn't want to deflate the economy as some others do. He doesn't want to raise taxes. He doesn't want to you know, he doesn't want to face in some ways the the grim consequences of this massive injection of inflation into the world economy well what he wants to do is to borrow petrodollars which is you know the wealth that's been generated by mm -hmm. the sheikhs and so on in the middle east but he doesn't want to do it through the middlemen through the names of zurich or london or wall street or whatever his his minister for energy is a guy called rex connor he says you know see if you can see if you can find someone who would be able to open up negotiations for us to borrow these four billion um you know kind of you know behind this behind the curtain kind of thing yeah and so rex connor um he finds a middleman who is a um a pakistani commodities dealer who is working out of london uh tirath kemlani who maybe um talks bigger than perhaps he should have done 
Right. He, he has a he talks a better game than perhaps he is actually able to execute on the pitch, because um, the likelihood basically he doesn't have the contacts that he's told Connor that he does, and he seems to have employed his secretary to go around various capitals sending telexes to give the impression <laughs> that um, that Kemlani himself is there negotiating big <laughs> right. deals. Yeah. And so it becomes increasingly evident that you know that he's stringing um, uh, Connor along, and the opposition and the press start to get wind of this. And by this point, inevitably, Murdoch has turned against Whitlam, yeah, and is starting to sharpen the knife. Um, and Whitlam, who is not a you know we said is not a, a details man, starts to wake up to this. And so in a, a, a measure of panic, he he revokes the license that uh, Connor had to, to borrow this money. Um, but Connor continues to try and get the money and he's staying up all night by the telex machine waiting for, you oh, know, no. his ship will come in, yeah. but it doesn't. And although Connor's, you know, Connor stands up and says, you know, I'm an honest man, I wouldn't do this, mm -hmm. but he has actually, you know, he's, he's, he's still trying to do it, even though he's legally not allowed to. And so this then precipitates the great crisis that undoes Whitlam. So we, ever since we started this podcast, Tom, I mean, this, this whole, the rest is history. Our Australian listeners have been saying to us, will you do the Gough Whitlam story and the fall of Gough Whitlam? Because it obviously looms so large. And look, it's so complicated. It All the stuff about the Senate, yeah. the two halves of the Senate being elected at different times and we yeah. dissolve half the Senate and all this. But basically the upshot is, isn't it, that... Um, he doesn't have a majority in the he Senate. He doesn't have a majority in the upper house. And the, op and the upper house... Um, the liberals, or the 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 liberals and their allies have a majority. Yeah, and um, the the liberal leader, a guy called Malcolm Fraser, who we'll come to in a bit, he he basically goes for the kill, sort of twists the knife, and he, and he's using his majority in the Senate, they're using the Senate to block Whitlam's government getting supply, so they can't which, get anything through. Yes, which is which is legal, but no one had ever thought to do it. It had never crossed anyone's mind that this would be an option. Yeah, but it's there. It's legal, and so they do it. So there is a British parallel again, which is um, what happens to um, Asquith and Lloyd George at the end of the nineteen hundred. So nineteen hundred oh nine, nineteen ten, um, the House of Lords trying to block Lloyd George's people's budget, and you get this massive face-off between the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and it's a little bit like that in the nineteen seventies in Australia. Yeah. That and it's a little bit also like the. Um uh happens in america isn't it exactly they, yes yeah. it is between the, the battles between the presidency and and congress if the congress yeah. have, have, and they end up shutting down the government sometimes yeah in america but obviously whitlam thinks um whitlam will not call an election to kind of break the deadlock he thinks and this is his confidence his patrician confidence i suppose even though the government is due to run out of money because it can't get any of its supply bills through he thinks he can just sort of brazen this out and eventually well, so the so authority, yeah. so the arbiter, as it were, would normally oh, in Britain it would be the monarch, wouldn't it? But in Australia, uh, yeah. it's the governor general. Well, uh, yeah. So I think there are two reasons why Whit Whitlam is confident. Well, I think there are three. I think the first is that he genuinely feels this is a constitutional outrage. Yeah. Um, uh, secondly, the public is behind him. So seventy yes. percent of the Australian public regard this, you know, this threat from the Senate as wrong. So he's, he feels he's got public backing. And the third reason is that the Governor General, who is the representative of the Queen as head of state in Australia, um, is a guy called Sir John Kerr, who Whitlam himself had appointed. And Sir John Kerr had once been a Labour Party, I think, yeah. member, or at least a very keen supporter. What Whitlam doesn't know is that John Kerr's politics have, have changed since then. And, and also that... Yeah, and also that that Kerr is resentful of what he sees as Whitlam's high-handed treatment of him, and the way that um, a lot of Labour MPs laughed him behind his back. They laughed his uh, hair, didn't they? <laughs> the Liberace of the law, they call him, because he's got this sort of um, very very white, yeah, silver hair. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so basically, uh, Kerr is open to siding with Fraser. Yeah, and um, Whit so it's it, it's on Remembrance Day, nineteen seventy five. And Whitlam goes in, basically, you know, so, so they're running out of money. The, the, the guillotine is about to drop. And Whitlam basically goes in to Kerr to say, you know, you've got to sort this out. And Kerr, Kerr says, you're sacked. <laughs> yeah. Get out. Yeah. And, and Whitlam can't believe it. And rather than kind of laughing at him or telling him to, you know, get on his bike, 
he he walks out and he he accepts it. And the moment he's gone out, Malcolm Fraser comes in, swears the oath, and is sworn in as prime minister. And there's an amazing scene outside where the, someone reads a proclamation saying, um, you know, uh, Whitlam God save the Queen, and ending with the words "God save the Queen." Yeah. Which Whitlam had tried to get with, you know, had basically tried to get taken off all the proclamations, and Whitlam is standing there. Where this while this happens, and he says, "Well, may we say God save the Queen, because nothing will save the Governor General." He gives this very defiant, yeah, speech, and, and um, the, the proclamation you've just heard was countersigned Malcolm Fraser, who will undoubtedly go down in Australian history from Remembrance Day, nineteen seventy five, as Kerr's Kerr. That's very <laughs> great good. stuff. Kerr. It's very good, but I mean, it all turns out disastrously for Whitlam. This is the thing. It's obviously a huge sort of controversy in Australian history and because a lot of people still think that um, Whitlam was, it was a constitutional coup against Whitlam, that the CIA yeah. were behind it, that yeah. the Americans put them up to it, all this sort of stuff. That's John Whitlam Kerr behaves was, very well. I mean, he just takes so, it, doesn't he? So, so he, yes. And one, and, and um, so he, and Bob Hawke, who's very kind of prominent trade union leader who will become prime minister later on, he, they, they both behave very well in that they don't weaponize it. Mm -hmm. because they're worried about imposing too much, too many fracture strains on Australian yeah. civic society. They're the Al reflects... Gores of uh, Australian yeah, a politics. Yeah, a bit, a bit, yeah, a bit. But the um, extraordinary thing is that Willem loses that election because there is an election in December. Massively. I and mean, Fraser wins a massive landslide. Yeah, I think the second largest majority in Australian history or something. And I would um, assume this is partly a verdict on the fact that the economy is obviously much worse than it had been a few years earlier because of the oil crisis and so on. So there's a general downturn, but also because people are sick of the, it's a bit of a get Brexit done kind of atmosphere. They just want it over with. And this is a way to get it over with. Yeah, maybe. maybe. Do you not think? Yeah, I don't know. I think, I, I mean, I would guess that it's, um, I mean, pretty much every government that has an election in 1975 loses, don't they? Yeah. I mean, it's. Okay. There's an anti-government mood in there. Yeah, because, yes. of, you know, in the wake of the oil crisis, everyone's, you know, they're all falling like, like yeah. dominoes. Um, so, uh, so Whitlam, Whitlam resigns, um, uh, and he, he becomes Australia's representative to UNESCO in Paris. So and know, died it could, be worse, could be worse fate. Died at the end of 98. Yeah. So he's the longest lived Australian prime minister right. and he became, he became mates with, uh, with Fraser in the end. But not with Kerr. Not with Kerr. Kerr apparently had to leave Australia. He came, yes, he, came so he ended up in London and he just used to stagger around at gentlemen's clubs. <laughs> yeah. Drunkenly saying that he'd been wronged. Well, talking of people staggering around clubs, <laughs> we now turn to the career of Malcolm Fraser. Yeah. So he's a man who look. I, I mean, when I, I, I couldn't really picture him because I'm not super familiar with Australian politics. But when I looked him up, he, he looks like all Australian prime minister. He looks like an, a casting agency yeah. has supplied him. And he sounds like one, doesn't he? Yeah. He's, he's a sort of, he's, he's quite, you know, looks. I mean, Malcolm Fraser is a Scottish name, but it also sounds quite like an Australian prime it minister. It does. It does. He looks like a sort of, Big chiselled, yeah, you know, a mate, man's man, kind of. <laughs> well, he's the son of a sheep farmer. He is. Well, he's, he's a classic Australian. He's the son of a sheep farmer who studies at Oxford, Magdalen College. Did, so there's you know, the. Do you know the degree? No. PPE. PPE. Oh wanna, well. Do you want to guess the class? First. Third. 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 <laughs> okay, so there, there, there it is. Um, son of a sheep farmer, Magdalen, uh PPE third. Yeah. And he's um, quite pragmatic, isn't he? He's one of those sort of, and in Britain, he would be a sort of Ted Heathish kind of figure, I suppose. And his politics, yeah, do you know what I think? Faintly technocratic, I would guess. Yeah. Um, he's, I mean, obviously the left hate him because he's, they see him as having played, yeah, he did play his part in this essentially constitutional coup. But he's, um, you know, and, and actually he's, I mean, he's, he's not a, in any way a kind of tub thumping right winger. No. So he's, he, um, the the collapse of the white Australia policy is absolutely you know he 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 he's very happy for the Vietnamese boat people to come to Australia he behaves yeah. very well over that and he's prime minister um, for quite a while eight years yeah yeah he's uh, he plays a leading role in opposing apartheid um, and then he uh, he um, he loses the election in 1983 to Bob Hawke's Labour uh, and then after his um, after he's lost he then <laughs> he then he goes on foreign travels. He so does. in 1986, he goes on, he goes to America uh, yeah. and he visits the fine and fair city of Memphis. Memphis, Tennessee. And this is the one thing, actually, that basically he'll be remembered for. <laughs> yes. People outside Australia who are not quite as, you know, like us, who are not massively um, 
fascinated by the details of Australian policymaking. And this is by far the, the signal fact about him, isn't it? So it's the 14th of October, 1986. And Malcolm Fraser, former Prime Minister of Australia, is discovered in the foyer of the Admiral Benbow Inn in Memphis with no trousers, wearing only a pair of underpants in a state of and, some confusion. And the Admiral Benbow Inn is not the most reputable of establishments. I think we can say it's downright seedy. Yeah, it's very, very seedy. And he has lost um, he's lost his Rolex watch worth $10,000, his passport, his wallet, and $600, I think, in cash. Uh, and so there's considerable debate as to what was going on and yeah. all kinds of theories. His wife um, says this is an absolutely terrible story. And that he, he's the victim of a practical joke. Yeah, a practical joke by fellow delegates at his sort of Commonwealth group meeting. Is that the way that people involved with such groups normally behave, would you say, Tom? <laughs> I don't. I have no idea. So, I don't know. So don't very, mean, I don't mix in such rarefied circles. Very mean-spirited people say that um, clearly he was visiting a lady of the night and it went she horribly everything, wrong. Yeah, yeah she yeah. took his trousers. Yeah. But uh, he came downstairs. You know what the concierge said? No. <laughs> she said um, she remembered him trying to, to conceal his modesty with a towel. <laughs> she said, uh, they're not real big. And I remember he was a big man. <laughs> so, I mean, you could take that as a compliment in some ways. Yeah. yeah. Good old Aussie. Um, well, I think, I think that's um, yet again – so much stuff to say about Australian prime ministers that we're running out of time. So, um, should we should we go for a third episode? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, come on, because we still we've got Bob Hawke, we've got we've um, got Paul Keating, Paul who's a great Bing. character. Yeah, the Lizard of Oz, <laughs> um, and then we've got the the kind of basically Game of Thrones bloodletting that so, is Australian so, politics exactly. in the twenty tens. So, the two of you who have made it through to the end of this podcast, <laughs> um, you can look forward to a third one in this extraordinary trilogy as we will be picking up next time with the yes. career of Bob Hawke. G'day. Yeah.